Patrick Graffini is a Republican pollster who has developed a reputation for deciphering data and spotting trends. So when Patrick shared a copy of his new book with me, I knew it was worth paying attention to. The book is called Party of the People Inside the Multiracial Populist Coalition Remaking the GOP, and it's on sale today, perfectly timed for Election Day 2023. Patrick, we're delighted that you would be with The Daily Signal today on such an important day for you. Congratulations on the new book. Thanks, Rob. It's great to be here. Well, your work with the Republican Party goes back a couple of decades, and you have certainly had a transformational effect uh, not only on the party's apparatus and, and, and thrust into the digital age, but now in when it comes to, to polling. Uh, but I have to ask, did you ever expect to be writing about the multiracial populist coalition <laughs> that's remaking the GOP when you first entered into politics uh, all those years ago? Um, not, not in this way. Uh, and uh, the, how I would explain that evolution was, you know, I started out in Republican politics, maybe a little bit uh, kind of an establishment style Republican. Um, and, uh, you know, I was as surprised as anyone by Donald Trump's victory in 2016. And the fact that he was able to expand the Republican coalition first to include the Rust Belt states and dramatically expand, um, you know, Republican performance among, uh, you know, working class voters in 2016. And then in 2020, almost defying the odds and winning re-election with the help of more Hispanic voters um, and continued progress among Black voters and um, really kind of showing that um, this shift towards a multiracial populist politics, um, you know, is really happening. Um, and it really has upended really what we think the two parties are about. So when I first started in politics, Republicans had this reputation as being the country club party. Um, you had polling that continually um, reinforced that this was a liability for Republicans and Democrats had this reputation as being the party of the people, the party of the working class. Um, you had the book by Thomas Frank in 2004 talking about how, um, you know, how could it be that Republicans are starting to win uh, working class voters because they're voting against their economic interests. Flash forward almost 20 years, and that trend has completely almost reversed, um, you know, who is supporting the, the two political parties where Republicans are really consolidating and gaining support among non-college voters um, who I think define the working class today. Um, you know, and that's also a shift. Uh, the parties used to be defined by income and now they're defined by education. Um, and I argue that that's good news for Republicans in the sense of you have many more uh, working class non-college voters in the country than you have college educated voters. Um, so um, I did not expect Donald Trump to be the one who was able to pull this off, but um, my uh, credit goes to him for actually, um, you know, getting us to this point. I want to go back to Trump's election in 2016, but stay on that point that you just mentioned, because you you in the book um, document the numbers pretty clearly for for readers to see. Why do the non-college voters matter so much to whichever party is able to attract them and retain them as, uh, as loyal to them? So one of the numbers I, I uh, really mentioned early on in the book is that um, groups that, um, uh, you know, about 70 percent of voters belong to groups that have been shifting Republican in the last two presidential elections. And the way that's defined is you have white working class voters and you have voters who are uh, non-white uh, as a whole. Um, and that, um, you know, that holds whether or not they're college or non-college. Uh, the only group that has been shifting to the left have been white voters with a college degree. Um, so already you're starting to see Republicans becoming a, just a much more broadly based party in terms of the new support they're attracting. And yeah, that doesn't mean that all these voters are, 
you know, voting Republican uh, right now. Um, what that means is, um, you know, things are are changing right in that direction. And you know, as as a pollster. I really am mostly concerned about change um, uh, off the existing partisan baseline. So what new people can we attract? What new people can we add to the coalition um, to get to 50% plus one? Um, and those voters are mostly unified by uh, common life experiences that transcend their racial background. And primarily uh, today, that is graduating from college or not graduating from college is, is the primary dividing line. And what continues to be true, despite, I think, predictions to the contrary, is that non-college voters remain a strong majority of the country with at least 60% of the adult population having never graduated from college. And that number isn't really shifting. Uh, you've seen during the pandemic, people not enroll in college as much. Um, so uh, I think the political party with the initiative among that majority of voters um, is going to be the one that has a powerful advantage going into 2024 and beyond. Thank you for that answer. And, and take us back seven years ago to Election Day 2016. Was that the point where you began to see this trend emerge, or were there signs even predating that that there was maybe some opportunities for Republicans to make inroads? Um, so it was clear that Republicans would make inroads heading into 2016 among working class voters. The, the difference was the belief that they would be more than offset by losses among college graduates or more than offset by losses, especially among minority voters. Um, and uh, the losses among non-college graduates were actually pretty significant in a lot of places. The issue, though, and why they didn't end up mattering as much is that they were concentrated in states that did not matter as much in the Electoral College. So think about the coasts and California, New York, um, are places with a lot of college graduates, but they don't matter much because they always vote Democrat, no matter what, in elections. Uh, the states with a lot of college graduates were places like Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin that really mattered a lot. Um, so it was uneven how that shift played out. But the other thing that didn't also happen um, that I think many people, including myself, expected to happen is that Trump really didn't lose any ground among minority voters. He didn't really lose very much ground, actually gained some ground among African-American voters. Uh, evidence is mixed on the Hispanic vote, but didn't really lose much ground there. And he made pretty significant gains. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, that speaks to the fact that white working class voters and minority voters, the members that the sort of mainstay of the Republican coalition, this mainstay of the Republican coalition and this mainstay of the Democratic coalition have a lot more in common than people think in terms of how they vote, in terms of how they process information and think about the issues that are before them. It is a very, I, I think, practical, I mean, they are very pragmatic, uh, practical about their choices. Um, they care about the performance of the political parties, and they care right now about the performance of the current administration when it comes to inflation and um, the rising costs of, of, of basic necessities. And um, I think that that um, is really what's driving this trend forward. We are talking with Patrick Graffini, author of the new book, Party of the People. Uh, Patrick, you did a, a preview of the book for Politico magazine, which focused on how Democrats lost this working class vote. Share with us about more about this political realignment, particularly with somebody in the White House who really has, at least from my perspective, made an effort to reach working class voters, showing up, for instance, recently on the UAW picket line, emphasizing his roots in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, does this come as a surprise to you at all? I think that it shows that the trends are so strong. And by the way, the trends are not just in America. They're happening in throughout the Western world. Um, so you see this realignment along class lines that it's happening in elections uh, really around the world. Um, so um, uh, so I, I think that um, uh, Biden can only do so much to mitigate, I think, uh, the the effect, the fallout from 
um, these trends that are unfolding and have been unfolding for decades, really. I mean, going back to the 1960s when um, you had uh, Richard Nixon, you know, really trying very hard in 1972 to appeal to the hard hats, to these uh, union members, and ultimately succeeding in that and succeeding in a way that ha we haven't seen until Donald Trump in 2016. But it, these trends have really been unfolding over a really long period of time. And so that's why I argue they're going to be hard to reverse. Like you might see in a future election, you know, maybe things go back to quote unquote normal. But having come, you know, myself, sort of my personal journey, having come from the more uh, started out my career in the more establishment, let's say, wing of the Republican Party and of the conservative movement, um, I would say we're not going back to that. You know, we're not going to be going back to a period in time where uh, Republicans and conservatives are counting sort of upper income people as core members of the coalition, which was the case as recently as 2012, um, that things have fundamentally changed, they have shifted, and that means our policy priorities as well need to shift to reflect that. Let's also talk about two other important groups where we're seeing Republicans make gains, that's uh, Hispanic voters and, and black voters. What can you tell us about this change, and, and why do you attribute this improvement, uh, particularly since Republicans historically have struggled with these minority groups? You know, it was a surprise, right? I mean, it was a surprise in both 2020, you know, it was a surprise in 2020 um, to see the gains that um, Trump made with Hispanic voters, but nobody thought he could. You know, how could somebody who talks about the border the way Trump does? And it turns out, uh, you know, Hispanic voters in particular um, they care just as much about border security as other voters do. I mean, that is a myth that, uh, you know, they don't care. And I think in some ways, you know, they don't, you know, the current wave of, uh, you know, for the at least the Hispanic voters who vote, right, are uh, Hispanics who came here legally to the United States. And so, um, uh, so, so that is, that's a big difference, right? When you, when you see these waves and these, this news footage of illegal immigrant, illegal immigration at the border, um, in the polling I've done close to the border, um, you see those Hispanic voters, especially more so than others are more concerned about uh, what's happening down there. So it's a myth. It turns out to be a myth that, you know, Trump had, and Republicans had alienated Hispanics. Uh, with uh, with that issue, um, so I, I think that you know, essentially the issue set did change in 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 2020. It became more about the economy. This is a very economically focused voting group, more so than maybe even a focus on social issue. They're very economically focused and focused on getting ahead uh, in America, making it in America. And you know, I think they're responding to some degree to the policies that they're seeing come out of both the Democratic and the Republican parties and concluding that, you know, at least the Republican policies, you know, when you look at a place like South Texas of supporting oil and gas, um, uh, that those are the things that they understand that are actually seeing in their lives that are helping them get ahead and uh, get good jobs. And so that is really, I think, the trends we're seeing play out, uh, you see it in South Texas, you see it in places like South Florida, um, in the Cuban American community, you see it in Orlando with Puerto Ricans. I mean, it's across the board, we're seeing this. Over the weekend, Patrick, the New York Times uh, revealed its latest polling results in key swing states for the 2024 presidential election with Donald Trump uh, besting Joe Biden in five of those six states. What, um, what trends are you watching in, in those places in particular? Obviously, they will be the deciding factor uh, with the Electoral College. Uh, what should our listeners be paying attention to that's on your mind? Uh, those polls showed the arrival of this coalition, what I call the multiracial populist coalition. And, um, you know, it, it really is um, about the fact that in this poll, Trump was getting 22 percent of the African-American vote. He was losing Hispanic voters by just eight points. Um, he uh, was within one point among voters under 30. Um, so, um, you know, if any version of that, even a more mild version of that materializes on Election Day one year from today, 
I think we can say this coalition has arrived. It has uh, really delivered um, and, and, you know, is really changing, I think, the makeup of the two political parties. Um, now, it's still early, but I, I, I do think that, you know, the reason why we are seeing Biden having, you know, such, uh, such trouble, I, I think, um, is primarily due to these voters um, and the core pillars of who have been to date, some of the core pillars of the Democratic coalition who are abandoning, uh, abandoning uh, him for Trump. And it's not just like they're not voting. It's that they're actively, you know, you have 20, when you have 22 percent of, of black voters saying not just, you know, we're maybe going to sit the election out, but we're actually going to go cross over and vote for Trump. That is historically unprecedented for a party that has really struggled to gain even 10 percent of the black vote. Now, we're obviously operating under the assumption that, that Joe Biden does, in fact, uh, win the Democratic nomination and, and, and run for reelection. Um, when you remove him from the scenario, though, are there any warning signs that you think conservatives or Republicans should be mindful of from either this New York Times poll or your own studies at Echelon Insights? Yeah, so they they ran a number of different scenarios, and uh, it turns out if you remove Trump, a generic Democrat would beat Trump by eight points. Now, he would still do better among some of these voter groups, but um, it really just shows you the extent to which uh, Biden has become a drag on the ticket uh, on on Democrats um, specifically. Um, and, um, and I, I believe that, you know, I, I think obviously Trump is running again. He has an opportunity to recreate and expand this coalition. Um, in many ways he brought it about, um, he accelerated the trend that I think was already happening, was already unfolding, but I think his message, um, really pushed it forward. But now that we've had, you know, uh, Republicans have had a couple of elections with Trump as the standard bearer, voters have realigned. Uh, I don't think we're going back to the old coalitions. So I think other candidates too certainly have the opportunity to, uh, carry it forward, carry that coalition forward. As we've seen in elections, I think we saw that in, New York, in Florida, in some of the positive results that came out of the midterms, um, you're seeing other candidates win with Trump's coalition. Let me ask you this, a great segue to, to this next question. The next Republican presidential debate will take place in Miami Wednesday night. Those candidates are obviously all well below Trump when it comes to polling, including in, in some of the key early states. Do any of them have an opportunity to expand on this coalition that we, you and I have been talking about here on this interview and make the same sorts of gains among the multiracial populist coalition that Trump has? I mean, I think you saw DeSantis do it in Florida, actually do it in Florida. You saw, and I think Nikki Haley certainly personally represents, uh, you know, the fact that, um, uh, you know, that somebody who is a minority is not an autom automatically a Democrat, right? I mean, I think she has a very, would have a very personally powerful message around that. Um, you know, Tim Scott also brings, you know, he, he is also a different uh, face, a different kind of face. But I, I you know, I, I don't think, um, you know, I don't think Republican voters are going to be the diversity police here, right? Um, I think they're going to decide um, this race on the merits. But what I do think um, that the, this coalition has staying power, right? Um, you know, I, I think that this is a coalition that ultimately kind of just is the coalition that kind of sees the world as it actually is and not uh, as this liberal utopia, right? I think that's really what unites them and defines uh, this multiracial populist coalition, whether you're a member of a minority group or whether you're working class. You're somebody who, um, you know, had to fight hard for everything they've gotten, didn't have anything handed to you, and is not taken by, let's say, these academic theories and the things and all the craziness we're seeing on college campuses right now. Even if you know, maybe they vote a Democrat in other elections. It's just a much more practical, level-headed, I think, type of voter that is gravitating towards the Republicans right now. Patrick, are there any final words you want to say about your new book or any other things that uh, you're observing right now? 
I mean, I, I, I'm very excited to share this, uh, this book with folks. It's been a long time coming. I started uh, right after the 2020 election, and I'm even surprised myself at how well this seems to have held up even uh, into heading into uh, the 2024 election. So I hope it can be a lasting contribution, I think, to uh, our understanding of uh, of where we are in our politics right now and what really defines uh, these two political parties. Well, Patrick Graffini, I think it will be a lasting contribution. Again, the book is called Party of the People Inside the Multiracial Populist Coalition, Remaking the GOP. We thank you for joining The Daily Signal and best wishes as you promote the book. Thanks, Rob.